Welcome to Leadership and Life Chat with your hosts, me, Becky Ames. And me, Mark Curtis. In each episode, we'll be illustrating how success in leadership is inextricably linked with success in life. Whether it's leadership in business, society, family or friends, we're all leaders. Using our experiences and a range of expert guests, we'll share secrets to boosting your health, wealth and self. So let's get on with the show. Stress is an everyday part of life. But the question is, how full is your stress bucket? Today's special guest, Jin Lally, is an expert in helping people recognise how full their bucket is and how to empty it as well. You'll probably notice that I'm on my own today. Becky's lost her voice. Some may wish I'd lost mine, but you've got me and Jin. So Jin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. It's good to be here. Right, it's a pleasure to have you. So just to get the listeners warmed up a little bit, would you like to tell them a little bit about your journey, your backstory and what brought you to this point? Yeah, well, I'm a solution focused psychotherapist now. Don't be scared by all those big words. <laughs> uh, basically, it means I help people empty their stress buckets for anxiety, stress, depression, all those sort of things. But my journey started, I had a very sort of standard education, A-levels. I began my journey as an optometrist which is just a posh word for being an optician. Uh, And I loved that career. I did that for 20 years uh, and I really, really loved it. But the underlying theme of of seeing people and talking to them about their general health and medication, I was seeing a common theme of stress, anxiety, depression, mental health issues altogether. So uh, sometimes, Mark, I was seeing like 18-year-olds on antidepressants. I was thinking, oh, and that used to really make me sad because like that's that's not a way to cope as well. And then you'd see a lot of people on heart medication, blood pressure medication. I knew all the names of all those medications, uh, type 2 diabetes. And once you start talking to people, you know, they'll start telling you their story. I love hearing people's stories. Everyone's got a story, right? So when you hear people's story, they'll say, oh, well, you know, I think I've been stressed, this has happened to me in my life. And especially if you see patients regularly, so sometimes you'd see patients once a year uh, for regular checkups, and you'd build a bit of relationship with them. But then actually on the flip side of that, I also saw a lot of people who were very, very healthy. People well into their 60s, 70s on zero medication. But they also had a story, right? Like I said, we've all got a story. They had a story that was in stress. They had things that happened to them. And I was actually more fascinated with them. I was like, what What have you got that we could all bottle up and sell and make loads of money out of that? That, you know, what is it? What is it that some people cope with stress and some people don't? So I retrained um, in, I wanted to do something in the mental health sphere and the talking therapy sphere, because I thought, you know, that's, that's a lot, you know, that is what's helping people. But I didn't like the the thought of counselling and talking about people's problems. But that doesn't fit my personality as well. So I know we, we all have problems, but sitting there talking about them and trying to pick them apart doesn't agree to me. So I found solution focused work. And so I retrained in this. And as soon as I saw it, when I was doing all my research, I thought, oh, this this is a fit for me. This is, I didn't realize that there was a word for my personality being solution focused. Uh, So I do this now and I've been doing this for about six years and I love it. I really, really enjoy it. Wow. Well, what what a journey. And and as you say, you got to see so many people in your previous career as well. And I mean, so many things, so many questions off the back of that. I mean, firstly, you know, you think 18 year olds on antidepressants. I, I, I was I was reading something a while back where I, was, I think in the in the United States, antidepressants is like the biggest prescribed medication. Um, yeah. And, you know, and 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 and. You think well actually medication has a place you know, we, we're not here saying people shouldn't medicate but it's all it almost feels like in the modern world and I, with my own parents with like cholesterol it's like well we'll put you on statins and you've got to be on for the rest of your life and you know and i know we're trying to get like homeostasis with the body all the while by but but i guess one thing is and i've read it through blood pressure you you start giving certain medications and it might bring an element of homeostasis to the body but it has a knock on effect onto something else and you know as we say i'm not here saying people shouldn't take medication no don't listen to not dr mark you know i'm i'm worse than dr google you know but it's like 
it does make you think, are there other ways, are there other solutions which people can investigate and try? There's got to be, hasn't there? Um, even mm. as a therapist, me, I have nothing against any medication that people are on for like anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants. They've all got a place. But if you're putting an 18 year old on antidepressants, that's, you know, where, where's this going to end? And no other coping skills. They weren't having any other coping yeah. skills. I do also see it from a GP's point of view. So I talk to a lot of GPs and, you know, they've, they've got 10 minutes to talk to you, 15 minutes if you're lucky. And so, yeah. you know, what do you, what can you do in that time? You can't talk about something. On the flip side of that, I also met a doctor once who retired early and he retired early because he had some complaints against him because when people were going to see him, he was sort of prescribing he thought in a very nice way he goes I think you need a holiday I, I would like to prescribe mm -hmm. a holiday I would like to prescribe that you drank more water I would like you mm -hmm. to prescribe that maybe you move a little bit more and go on some walks um, and actually he had some complaints against him because some people want to pop a pill it seems mm -hmm. like the easy solution you know, if we yeah. can pop a pill to bring our blood pressure down, well, that sounds a lot easier than going to a gym or something, doesn't it? So I can yeah. see the argument from both sides, uh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, blood pressure is what I know a little bit about because I, I used to suffer from elevated blood pressure. Um, and I, I was thinking I'm too young to go on tablets and you know, I don't want to do this. And my sister-in-law said, you need to read this bookmark. And it, it was it was by a German uh, doctor who's a specialist in hypertension. And it was a fast, I can't remember the name of the book now, but I've, I've passed it on to several people over the years. And, and it was it was really interesting. And then it got to the middle of the book and you had to fill in this questionnaire to work out what your predominant type was. And I came out as a stress type and a stress type was someone who is usually driven. Um, they are successful in what they choose to do. Um, and, and it was kind of, the, you know, they're competitive against themselves, all of this stuff. I was thinking, wow, that's me, you know, and, and then it was, it came up with the things you can do based on your personality type of stress type as I was to do something about it. So one was junk, junk the running watch, because when I used to go out for a run, I had to try and beat myself all the while. Uh, yes, so literally yeah, I used to do loads of, of running and cycling back then. So I thought I was doing good because I thought I'm doing exercise, yeah. but yeah. it wasn't, it, I, I was stressed while I was exercising. You know, I, I had the onboard computers on my bike. I had my running watch on, just junked it all. And I thought I'm going to go for a run, go for a cycle. Mindful yeah. meditation kicked in with me then as well. You know, be, I was a yeah. doer. Um, I needed to become more of a beer. So, yeah, so and, and my journey has been that my blood pressure has been consistently lower since I did those things. You know, and it, it can't be accident. That that's not by accident. Brilliant. It's by yeah. design because no, I was just yeah. doing different ways which naturally controlled it. Now I know it's yeah. not the same for everybody, but that was eye opening for me that there was a different way because when I started reading the side effects of some of these drugs around water retention and all, I thought, wow, I don't really want to go there unless I absolutely have to. You you said something interesting there, Mark. First first of all, well done for doing that. I think that's brilliant. But you said it's not the same for for everybody. It, it is the same for everybody. You took ownership right. yourself. You said, I don't want to go on medication. I don't want to go on medication for this. This is it's just getting a little bit high enough that I can monitor it. I can maybe bring it down with some lifestyle changes. I can do something about it. But the the biggest thing there is you had the right mental attitude. And you can nurture that mental attitude. Okay, you already had it because you were this stress type. So, you know, there was, you know, there was a goal and you were going to reach it. So your new mm. goal became, let's bring the blood pressure down and find ways to do that. But we've got to start taking ownership for our own physical and mental well-being. We, mm. we can't be looking for external things to help us. We've got to take ownership. I'm sure we'll talk about it in a moment. You could be working in the best workplace, but you could still be stressed if you're not taking ownership yourself. There's so much your employer can do. There's so much your partner and family can do. There's so much your doctor mm. can do. The medicine's all there. You've got to decide which medicine you want to take. So do you want to, like you, you know, let me say, what can I do here to change my lifestyle a bit to try and counteract this? Now, there's some things that, you know, are genetic. 
I will definitely say, yeah, that's I totally understandable. I understand where genetics comes into it, but we do have a choice in how we cope and, and how we manage. But it's about taking taking a bit of ownership now. And I think a lot of people are coming around to this because a lot of the clients I see will say, I don't want to go on medication, Jim. That's the first thing the doctor said to me, and I need to do something about this. That that was a really interesting start to the podcast. The first question I really wanted to ask, which wasn't one of those at all, was. I want to hear more about your podcast and your concept of stress bucket. I'd be really interested <laughs> to hear a bit more about that. <laughs> that that's oh, my medical that history done. We'll, ah. yeah, we'll, we'll deflect from me. I don't want to talk about my medical issues anymore. <laughs> we'll move on to the stress <laughs> yeah, bucket. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> well, uh, you, you'll you'll be able to understand all of this because, yeah, that is what I talk about. So, yeah, uh, so my podcast is called Stress Bucket Solutions. Uh, I've written a book called How to Empty Your Stress Bucket. So there's a common theme here, isn't there, about a stress bucket. <laughs> so my, um, what I talk a lot about how the brain works. I try to help people understand how the brain works and how to, they get to this point where, yes, they might have high blood pressure, blood pressure sorry and they're going to bring it down or you know they're going to try and make themselves better or they've got lots of anxiety they've got depression where does that come from in the brain so my concept of a stress bucket is if you can have an empty stress bucket this does not mean that you will never have stress if you can have an empty stress bucket it means you have the capacity to deal mm. with stress because life is full of stress you know, so I see a lot of um, uni gra newly graduated students and they've just got their first job and they say, right, that's it, Jane. I've got my I've got this job I wanted. I want the relationship I want. Um, I want to now buy the house I want and I'm going to live happily ever after. Now, you and I know, Mark, we're old enough to know that that doesn't happen. <laughs> life comes at us right so by having yeah. an empty stress bucket you then have a capacity to deal with stress what fills up our stress bucket is negative thoughts it's not the events in your life so the things that happen in our life don't fill up our stress bucket it's if we yeah. ruminate on those negative thoughts and the really important thing to remember there is if you are thinking negatively and going through negative scenarios of your past or negatively forecasting the future, your mind doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. You've probably heard yeah. that before. I always say to people, if you don't believe me, just go and watch a really good horror film. You know, it's a film, <laughs> it's on TV, but your heart's racing, yeah. you start sweating, you think something's going to happen. Our imagination is so powerful that if we are reliving our past traumas, your mind thinks that hasn't only happened once in reality. It thinks it's happened maybe a hundred times. Yeah. And the same, yeah. if you negatively forecast the future, if you think that meeting you're going to tomorrow is going to be a complete disaster and you think about that negatively today 50 times, I bet you any money tomorrow will come along, you'll go to that meeting and it'll go really well. But your mind thinks you've been to 51 meetings in the last two days and 50 <laughs> have gone badly. Yeah. It can't tell the difference. I know intelligently, you know, it was your imagination, but the feeling that you get, that is what's starting to fill up your stress bucket. So that ruminating on your thoughts is what fills up your stress bucket. And my job now as a therapist is to empty your stress bucket for you. And yeah. then teach you how to keep it empty yourself. But once you understand those principles, you can start to um, apply tools and techniques pretty much straight away. Yeah, so that, that's, so that, we, that's we, how I talk I was, about it. I was going to come in here and just say, Jen, I was going to say, we were joking earlier that I had nothing really to contribute. So I wasn't going to be involved. But oh, actually, you're straight in and you're straight in. Straight in there. Uh, you picked my interest there with the horror film analogy because <laughs> I nearly wrote my uh, dissertation on how horror films are actually good for you so there we oh, go wow. I know a, li know a little <laughs> bit about that myself <laughs> and how are they good for you Lizzie are they, like is it getting the adrenaline going is it getting a little bit stress like, levels up a little bit it's to do with the fear response so it's yes. actually um if you don't experience any kind of fear avoid mm -hmm. fear of all kinds in life 
then if you channel it through watching a horror film, it actually prepares you then for actual terrible things that might happen in the outside world. Absolutely. absolutely. A bit of an extreme way to do it, but go for it. I mean, I tell my friends all the time, I have like one friend who watches horror films with me and that's it. And I keep trying to sell it to everybody, but no one believes me. Mm. It doesn't work for me, Lizzie. Do you know why? Yeah. If if I watch a horror film and, and Glenda, my wife, loves horror films or psychological thrillers, I struggle with them because I'm just there I'm completely there and then and then I wake up at like half three in the morning um, and because I'm a certain age I need to go up for a wee wee um, and I'm like I don't get out of bed like I, hold on it's like you're 49 years old Mark I have a little chat with myself but then <laughs> no it's like no because like, and, and I'm standing there having to pee and I have to put all the lights on in case something creeps yeah. up behind me and stuff See, <laughs> so it's so real it doesn't work it's so me. real yeah, yeah but that, yeah. that's that was my point <laughs> that it's it's so real but you know Lizzie made a great point there that's why people you know all this um Mark, it's very trendy right now. Cold water therapy and cold yeah. water dips. That's the same principle that Lizzie just explained. If you can raise your stress levels to and then manage to keep them under control, that the the you know, the theory is that if you have something stressful in your life, you'll be able to cope for it. Cope with it. Mm. So yeah. it's that same principle, yeah, trying to increase your fear response. It's it's yeah. a bit of an e- extreme way to go about it. It's not necessarily something I recommend because it's not suitable for everyone but your example there mark yeah it was so real that you were you were still playing it over in your mind so if you imagine if yeah. you had had some sort of trauma in your past one it's already happened to you but secondly if you are going to relive it and relive it and relive it your mind thinks it's happened a hundred times mm. so that that's yeah. how powerful it is yeah all I took from that conversation was uh, that Mark was so scared by the film that he wet himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do, yes. And, 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 do you know, this is rooted in my childhood because when I was about, I don't know how old I was, maybe 10 or 12 or something, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, my mum had fallen asleep on the sofa and Frankenstein's monster, or Frankenstein as the film was called, came on. And I said to dad, oh, I'd really like to watch that. And he's like, yeah, okay, then I watched it and it just scared the living heebie-jeebies yeah. out of me. Yeah. And uh, and it's not even that scary a film like now, yeah. is it? You know, But it was yeah. for me at that age. Yeah. So I went to bed and I laid in bed and I was absolutely 100% convinced that Frankenstein's monster was behind my bedroom door and Mm. I was so scared I wanted to shout out to my parents and I was so scared I couldn't my mouth was moving but nothing was coming out and honestly I don't and that was like I don't know whatever it was now probably for getting on for 40 years ago I don't think my mum still forgive my dad for it (laughs) my mum hasn't good old dad hasn't forgiven my dad for the time that he allowed me to sit and watch the exorcist when I was only 10 oh my god oh wow Wow. In his defence, that would have destroyed me. In his defence, he didn't know I was there. I was peeking through the banisters on the stairs. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, you didn't know. Yeah, he didn't know. That's down to you. The, the other, final story, and then we will move on with stress-related things. Um, apparently, I used to hide behind the sofa when Doctor Who came on because I was so scared of the Daleks. And my dad also used to do that. So there you go. <laughs> what is it with dads? <laughs> I've had a lot of stress response exposure in my life. <laughs> yes, sounds like you have. Sounds like you have. So yeah, blood pressure is going to be up. <laughs> uh, so, so, so it's interesting what you were saying there, Jean, about the you, you, you know, with with um, younger people coming out of education into the workplace, um, and it is a massive, it's a seismic shift, isn't it? You know, I can still cast my own mind back, and you know, suddenly, not only did you, you know school and college was relatively easy with hindsight because you got loads of holidays um you only kind of were were there till three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever all of a sudden like nine to five plus monday to friday as it was probably then four weeks holiday a year it was just a seismic shift in like your reality and that in itself was a massive stressor because it was just so different And, and i guess that hasn't changed over the years there's still that big shift from education to workplace yeah yeah it, it's a culture shock as everything that, that's coming towards mm. you but on you know on the other hand you feel like you just said yes in hindsight it was the easiest time but if we go back to remember I remember distinctly you know being a student it was hard as well you know get your dissertation and do all this you're still trying to find your mm. identity there's lots of other things going on as well um, and then you think right everything was that culmination to get that degree wasn't it or that profession to get into mm. that profession maybe you had professional exams I know we did we had professional exams that you had to do everything was 
just that was the end goal become an up opto- at that time an optometrist that's mm. that was my example become that so once you get that you're like great right i've done it now now i want an easy life because i've worked hard so I want everything to slot into place because there was so much focus on that end goal. So it is stressful. So I really appreciate when, you know, people say, well, I'm working now and I'm earning mm. money. So I've done my professional exams. I've qualified. I'm now earning money. Now I want what I'm due mm. almost. And I, I totally understand that. But like I said, that that's not life. We've then, we've then got other things going on. But there's many, many people out there coping with life really well. You know, the last few years have shown us that. It's, why do some people cope and some people don't? We've, we've all got things yeah. going on. And actually, the lot of people that are coping well, they haven't had a charmed life. Mm. They have got issues going on. And often the people that cope really well are the ones that have really had quite a bit of trauma in their life. And I believe we should be examining those people. So Mm. I love mental health awareness and, you know, all those days and things that we do. And it's all good. But, you know, frankly, I'm getting a bit sick of awareness and we need a bit of action now as well. And action comes from not examining the problem because the mind doesn't work like that. So for all anyone who's in logically minded in engineering or, or those kind of professions, engineering, logical, accountants, those kind of things, they, they get to the root of the problem, find out what the problem is and then solve it from there. And that yeah. totally makes sense. But the mind doesn't work that way. The brain doesn't work that way. What we've got to do is we've got to look for solutions first. And that's where I strongly believe we should be examining those people who are resilient who have good mental fitness, you know, what are they doing uh, and what is their thought process and what is their biology that they are managing through life a lot better than people who aren't. Yeah. Just coming back to something you said slightly earlier before we got onto films, um, when you were talking about self-talk and certainly through, through my personal experiences and some of the reading and studying I've done, that the self-talk is just so important because you know not only is it constantly there because it's inside your own head but you believe what you tell yourself as well why wouldn't you believe what you tell yourself so coming back to your point of you know the the brain does it doesn't the subconscious doesn't know whether it's real or imagined it's just in your head and we've done quite a lot with our teams over the years on on self-talk and the internal chatter and ways to be able to kind of maybe manage that or at least be aware of it and then and then upgrade the language as well. And and we've done a couple of podcasts where we've framed the work of, um, he sadly passed away now, but Trevor Moad, an American guy, um, and his concept was neutral thinking. If you've, if you've got a lot of negative talk going on and you try and go to positive talk, A, positive talk is not always great because you don't, you still won't believe it if you don't truly believe what you're telling yourself. But he said it was a bit like, you know, having a car and shifting it from reverse to drive you know it's going to cause some damage to the gearbox so you need to go through neutral on the way um and he was very much just like neutralize your language and i think this it wasn't proven scientifically but it was his anecdotal lifetime work that it was something like a negative comment was um something like seven times more powerful than a positive comment um and if you externalize it so if you said it out loud it took on the power of 10 so so his work he 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 would always say that you know a negative a vocalized negative comment was 70 times more powerful than the positive one um yes. and and you think wow e- even if that's half true it's still massive isn't yeah. it you know yeah. and 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 all of the while you know but it would be so interesting as you say i suspect the people who have higher resilience their internal chatter is probably different, I would guess. It is. I totally agree with the whole neutral think. I say think neutral instead of thinking positive. So um, mm. that's principles I use in the work that I do for sure. But another way to look at it is let, let's look at the brain and, and what's going on here. So this negative part of the brain is the original part of our brain from caveman days. It's what helped us survive. And yeah. it's what we had to always look on the horizon for a problem. We had to see what was going wrong. We we lived and we are naturally geared towards the negative, And that's why human beings are at the top of the food chain, because we've always looked at the negative and found the solution. I get my clients to understand that that primitive negative part of the brain isn't the real you. It's your survival response. It will go negative. If there was a polar bear right now about to eat us, you wouldn't be thinking even neutral or positive by, oh, 
that looks like a cuddly polar bear. It might be vegetarian. <laughs> it might not eat me. You're going to think, no, I'm going to die. Yeah. And you ha- So you have to think negative for survival. You have to. Now in 2023, we're not living in those kind of times where we have to think to that ex- extreme ex- survival mm. instinct. We haven't got that there. So what we need to do is we need to create a shift to the positive part of the brain, the left prefrontal cortex here on the left side of your head. I call it the intelligent brain. It's attached to all your intelligent resource. And it's generally quite positive. And by positive, I don't mean it's all rainbows and unicorns here. I mean, it's very objective. It's very rational. It's very much in control and motivated. So I think people who, that we're talking about that internal chatter, people who have got good mental fitness, they know that that negative voice is just their survival response and they don't associate with it. So I ask my clients to create a bit of dissociation from it. Mm. Um, there's a really good book um, called The Chimp Paradox. Yeah. I don't, yeah. And that describes that negative voice as a little chimp. Yeah. And I know some of my clients even give their negative voice a name. They call it Colin or something. And they'll say, right, right, Colin, you can be quiet. So once you've done that, you're saying that negative voice is not part of me. There's a negative part of my brain that is trying to keep me safe. But me as an intelligent person involved in 2023 can say, look, Colin, calm down. It's okay. It's not a polar bear. It's just 200 emails in my inbox. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not that big of a threat. I know you might be feeling threatened, but, you know, we've got to manage the chimp. We've got to know how to manage it. So I think if you can create a bit of separation with that negative voice, that's that's infinitely useful as well. Yeah. That negative voice isn't you. It's just your survival response trying to keep you safe. So yeah. it's saying, you know, Mark, don't do that presentation. You're going to fluff it up. Don't go and for that promotion. Don't apply for that job. You might not get it. It's just, once you understand, it's just a, the part of your mind that's trying to look after you. You can say, no, but I do want to go for it. I do want to give it a go. It'd be amazing if I got this job or if, let me at least apply for it. So create, that's my tip. Create a bit of separation with that negative voice uh, as well. Yeah, and I, I love that. On a course years ago, um, the 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 person running the course said a thought is just that it's a thought it's not reality um and, and i think probably you know we've all we've all been in a situation as you say there where the internal thought the internal chatter we take it as a fact but it's mm-hmm. not a fact it's just a thought it's no more than that and it's it's almost as you say acknowledging it like it's almost saying yeah thank you for that um, but it, but that's just a thought and it's not the one i choose to then move forward with but it, yeah. but I guess you, it's all you've got to. It's a bit. Um, it's like any sort of fitness, isn't it? Whether it be physical fitness or mental fitness, you've yeah. got to be fit enough to be able to then do that part, which sounds really easy. Which is, thank you, I acknowledge that. It's only a thought. I'm not going to. I'm not going to listen to. It, I'm going to do something else. Yeah. You've got to be fit to be able to do that. And yeah. how do you, how do you work? What what sort of things do you do with people that would help them get that? You know, because because you can talk to them about the theory behind you know, the the internal chatter and don't don't allow it to you know, give it a name. How do you help people almost build that that sort of mental fitness, if you like, to get to that point where it's 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 easier to do that? Yep, yeah. uh, you're quite right. Uh, absolutely spot on there, Mark. So. In the first few sessions, I, I don't talk in the way that we've just been speaking. That comes later on. In the first yeah. few sessions, when I see someone, you've come to me with an overflowing stress bucket. You have lost control. Mm. You feel out of control. The thoughts have consumed you. And what we know about the stress bucket, it fills up with negative thoughts. So guess what? I'm not going to allow you in my session to talk negative. And that's, that's starting the brain training. We're going to start limiting what goes into your stress bucket in the first place. Yeah. So my first question in every session is, hi, Mark, tell me what's been good about your week. What's been good? I could have said, hi, Mark, how are you? I guarantee yeah. you, you might have said, oh, yeah, I'm all right, Jim, but it's pouring with rain and then uh, this <laughs> happened at work and you're going to go negative. I'm not going to allow you to go negative. I want you to tell me what's been good about your week because it must be good and it might only be small, especially if you're overwhelmed. I don't care how yeah. small it is. You, you had a nice cup of tea. You saw a cute dog. You made a nice dinner. Your friend rang you. You saw a good documentary on TV, whatever. You know, small things. And what we're doing there is because you can't just stop thinking negative. That's, again, that's not how the brain works. Mm. What we're doing here is we're creating so much positive thought that we're not allowing any room for negative thought. 
So that's the first thing I do. Next, we talk about, instead of examining and going backwards into your anxiety, what would you do tomorrow if you felt a little bit better? Not 100% better, just a little bit. So I use something called a happiness scale. So if you said on that happiness scale today, you were feeling a three even, I would say, okay, so if you woke up, imagine, because we know the imagination is powerful. Imagine waking up tomorrow morning and you were a four. That's just from three to four. I'm not, notice I didn't say 10, <laughs> just a four. What difference would that make? And then we start to visualize, well, if I was a four, maybe, you know, I'd get up a little bit earlier. It might only be a small difference. And then what we do is some relaxation techniques, which imitate REM sleep. Now, this is a big one. REM sleep is what empties your stress bucket. So you can limit what goes in there in the first place, but you can also empty it. So you already do it. It, The sleep you have at, at night called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when we dream. And what yeah. we're doing there is we're taking those negative thoughts out of our stress bucket and we're processing them and we're shifting them into our intelligent brain where we turn those memories from these negative emotional memories into very narrative objective memories. Sometimes we can even forget about it. So, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't remember that traffic jam I was stuck in last week because I've had a good night's sleep since then. And that's why we say things look better in the morning Mm. or it's good to sleep on it. So I'm a huge advocate for sleep. Sleep is Mm. free therapy. And I strongly believe that we have taught ourselves how not to sleep, which has increased mental health issues. Mm, really we interesting. We all need to sleep yeah, a bit I, more. I, I, I'd read somewhere else about that. And what one of the, um, and, and, and uh, it's, it was actually Dr. Andrew Huberman. I follow his podcast um, and I reference him quite a bit on here because he's a neuroscientist and you get some really interesting stuff comes out. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about, clearly there is no substitute for building healthier sleep routines um but if you find that you've had a a poor night's sleep for you know because it could be because of stress it could be anything which causes Mm. that um he said as a short-term fix but this is not a long-term solution it's just a short-term fix um doing some um nsdr so non-sleep non-sleep deep relaxation techniques yeah uh, yeah uh, so things like yoga nidra i think falls yep. into that category yeah that yep. can re that that can help if you just do it for half an hour that can very short term help with a poor night's sleep so it will allow you to function and and i guess what that's doing is from the sound of it is probably helping to empty out that stress bucket because you that's haven't right. had the rem sleep but it puts yeah. you in a position where effectively it happens in in waking time yes. but it's not going to be a long-term solution but so if someone's yep. really struggling because they they've had a really poor night's sleep if they can just find half an hour to do some yoga mm. nidra or something equivalent yep. that could make all the difference for the day ahead and and i guess the knock-on effect is it might then help them have a better night's sleep the next night it does it does it starts emptying the stress bucket so again if your mm. stress bucket is full it's going to stop you sleeping because you're vigilant that's yeah. the same analogy as if there was a polar bear sitting there right now you would not fall asleep because you'd be at risk. Why would you fall asleep? Yeah. The polar bear's gonna eat you. So you've got to stay on alert. So in every session I have with clients, we do do um, an imitation of REM sleep. We go into a trance-like state almost, or this NSDR, yeah. uh, and just for 15 minutes at the end of a session. But prior to that, we've been talking really positively for yeah. f- a good 45 minutes. And I've been helping you and training you and keeping you on the right track of the positive talk and not allowing any negative thoughts in. And that's what's that's what creates the change in the brain. We start literally creating new neural pathways in the brain. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so just sort of think so, so moving it to a slightly different angle of that. So exercise i'd like to perhaps talk about exercise in physical exercise because if we go back to the polar bear example um you know, our fight or flight response would kick in at that point so, so all of these stress hormones are kicking in for a purpose aren't they you know it's you know it's to yeah. kind of give us increased blood pressure give us that sort of almost superhuman strength at that yeah we'd probably go mm, i'm still not going to fight this polar bear because he's got big nasty claws and teeth so i'm just going to run like the wind and you you know and 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 all of those chemicals are there to help us run like the wind, to we, which we obviously couldn't outrun a polar bear. That's before we give this is if you're ever faced with a polar, polar bear, listeners, don't try and outrun it because you're not yeah, going that's to, it. you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But theoretically, yeah. you would just run like the wind to get away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And and then at the end of that, you would all of these chemicals which were coursing around your body and hormones would be 
well and truly burnt off, wouldn't they? It's given us our short-term power boost, and then we curl up in a ball under a tree and go to sleep. That that yeah. would kind of be what would happen yes. in nature, wouldn't it? So that's right. So, so when you're working with your, you know, your your advice around emptying your stress bucket, what what part does physical exercise play in that as well? Uh, a, a huge part. What we've got now is coming back to what you were saying. Yes, we would rest. We don't rest anymore, do we? Mm. As well. So you know, the polar bear is always there. 24 hour news, social media, an overflowing email inbox, work to do. So yeah, we used to be able to stop that rush of cortisol, the stress hormone and adrenaline was really good for us. It gave us mm. the energy to run from the polar bear, but at some point we would then became safe and our yeah. cortisol levels dropped. What we're finding now um, with people is their cortisol levels are high in the morning and they're remaining high all the way throughout the day. We're never escaping the polar bear. Mm. So by doing physical activity, one thing we are doing is we're burning off that adrenaline because most of the time we're, we're metaphorically running from the polar bear in our minds while we're sitting at our desk. We, we've got quite a sedentary lifestyle these days, haven't yeah. we? We're sitting at our desk and we're not doing anything to burn off the adrenaline and the cortisol. So we've got to find a way to do that. Mm. So it doesn't mean hitting the gym. I'll always say to people, it's called movement. You need to walk. You need to start cleaning all your windows or something, moving around, do some star jumps while uh, every few minutes at your desk, but get that adrenaline burnt off because it, if it's got nowhere to go, this is what's going to start clogging up your arteries. Your adrenal mm -hmm. glands, which are just above your kidneys, they're going to start pumping even faster and harder. But it's not, this adrenaline is not going anywhere. So you're going to get adrenal fatigue, which leads to type 2 diabetes. Mm. and high blood pressure this this is there's yeah. there's a pattern here it's, it yeah. just follows a pattern wow. if you understand biology yeah isn't it interesting where we started this podcast about you know things like high blood pressure medical conditions and you know there's a there's a lot of sticky plasters going over the stress response uh, injury effect because it's almost yeah. a stress response injury isn't it you know if you want to look at it in those terms and it furred up arteries you know everyone's told you know, don't eat saturated fat which you know several articles about whether that is true or not who knows but but the the number one problem with a lot of these things has got to just be stress hasn't it you know, adrenaline cortisol yeah. which are fantastic chemicals that you know hormones they are absolutely essential to us as human beings we need them but yeah. but we're but but not in the quantities we're getting them and not in not when you know like you say you're sitting at your desk you you can only hit your keyboard so hard when you're typing and responding to that email which has caused yeah. elevated levels you know so so yeah. yeah and it doesn't have to be you know hard exercise where you know it's not we're not talking sas training here no like no said, we're just, not talking a, boot camp just get up from your desk wander yeah, yeah. wander around the block yeah. you know just go, go for just a walk at something lunchtime to get some yeah, fresh air really interesting yeah the, so the other thing that happens is that cortisol causes inflammation now, that's really good. If the polar bear injured you, say you had a big gash across your arm, all that cortisol will help cause inflammation at that gash because you want it. That's, that's what a scab is, isn't it? So it's mm. going to scab, it's going to swell, and that's it starting to heal. All the white blood cells are going to go there as well. That's brilliant. If you have not got a physical injury, your cortisol is rushing around your body thinking, where am I going? Uh, mm. There's no physical injury here and there's no real polar bear. What am I doing rushing around this body? And that can cause inf any, any doctor, any biologist will tell you inflammation of any kind is dangerous. Yeah. When it's got nowhere the, to go. For the when wrong it, when it's attacking, For yeah. the wrong, it's attacking healthy yeah. cells here. Yeah. And that, that starts to, without getting too medical, in my layperson terms, that starts to sound a bit like autoimmune conditions. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's autoimmune conditions. That's what's going on there because it's just hasn't got anywhere to go. So we've wow. got to start understanding how we, how our cortisol levels work for us and can work against us. Yeah. So our cortisol levels are highest in the morning and they should come down gradually throughout the day. So they're lowest at the end of the night when we go to bed. Yeah. That's just not happening anymore, Mark. Mm. You know, like we're still answering our emails at five, six o'clock, and then we're watching the news at nine, 10 o'clock. You know, your cortisol's remaining high or dangerously going up and down, up and down, up and down. You're trying to bring it mm. down, it's going straight back up again, but it, it should come down slowly and gradually. Another reason to have physical movement is if, if we go back through evolution in our caveman days, the, the cave person felt good when 
we when we did things properly right when we were hunted and gathered properly when we looked after our family properly when we lived in the tribe properly we were designed to do all these things and what we know is that that's not not just a magical feel good feeling mm. what that was we know from biology is a, a flow of good neurotransmitters by neurotransmitter the the chemical that helps all our nerves communicate with each other and the main yeah. one i talk about is serotonin yeah. serotonin sometimes known as the happy hormone so it makes us feel yeah. good so we need to take that principle of what the caveman did and apply it to modern day times mm -hmm. and i call it the three p's and the three p's are positive activity positive interactions and positive thinking so that first one you've hit on there positive activity what activities we've got to move more yeah. You know, we're, we're getting in our cars that are on our driveways. We're driving to um, the big supermarket that's got absolutely everything that we need or the big shopping center. We park in their car park. We do our stuff there and then we get back in the car and we come home and we've done, what, 100 steps? Mm. Maybe a few around the supermarket. It's just not enough. Yeah. So we need to be getting our steps and we need to be moving a lot more than we are. And what that does is, so as well as bringing your cortisol and adrenaline levels down, it increases the flow of serotonin. So you're creating a happy hormone yourself. You can create this yourself. So we've got to get yeah. moving more. It's fascinating, isn't it? I, mean, I, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago and the person was talking about, we only need five things as a human being. We need food, water, shelter, clothing, mm -hmm. and tribe. Mm -hmm. um, and they said that the challenge with modern society is that you don't actually have to go and get any of those five because you can buy them all with money. Um, <clears throat> so, so if you take the extension of this conversation, mm -hmm. You know, people are able to to satisfy all five basic human needs by exchanging money for those yep. five things. Yeah. But it doesn't feed the soul and it doesn't feed the central systems of our body. Oh. In yeah. fact, it's doing the opposite because to get that money, 90% of people are probably causing themselves, you know, excess uh, adrenaline, cortisol. Yeah. They've got inflammation. So, so so it's easy to buy this stuff, but the damage absolutely. to their well-being is absolutely yeah. huge, isn't it? Yeah. So um, you think actually that there's probably a really, really, there's an easy solution here, which would also help with some of the um, global issues we face yes. around climate and plastics yeah, and everything definitely, else. That definitely. If we actually did a bit more of developing those five ourselves instead of yeah. doing it with money it yeah. could be it could be a real win-win situation yeah. you can sit at home on your own and you can order to the door everything you need there's an mm. app for that food can come to your door you can communicate while you're sitting on your phone with other people you do not need to leave your couch you know what i really want to get rid of that would really make a difference to people's the tribe a bit that you were talking about um self-service checkouts get rid of them yeah yeah. Self-service checkout is the worst thing ever. Those yeah. micro interactions that we, we should be having every day, they are so important. If you mm. can chat with someone in a shop, oh, hi, and just exchange, as we do, because we're so British, what's the weather like today? Yeah. Um, just talking about the weather, oh, hi, hello. It's about connection. We're yeah. losing it, Mark. There's a there's a shop here, I, I won't name it, but it's a very well-known high street uh pharmacy and a beauty place and it's here in edinburgh i've been in there it's the most soulless place you ever want to go into it's got everything mm -hmm. absolutely everything it's got these really bright white lights so it looks very clinical you could go in there find what you want there's no one to help you because it's all labeled on a shelf you take it to the self-service checkout you walk out you can go in there and not speak to one person I yeah mean, that's the same as getting it delivered at home yeah this, this was a real problem during the pandemic and lockdown. We lost connection. And yeah. likewise, coming back into the office. I'm not saying we should come back into the office full time. I know it does work for a lot of people. I love working from home. But what I've made sure in my diary now is because I work from home, I'm making sure I'm getting my social stuff in my diary. Before my social stuff just used to happen. I didn't have to put yeah. it in my diary. But now like, oh, right, I'm meeting my friend for a coffee at four o'clock. That's going in the diary. I don't want to forget that. We've got to get those connections back. So coming back into an office, it's not just about getting the work done. It's about, hi, how are you? How did, how was your weekend? What are you up to? Should we go for a cup of coffee? Um, should we meet you by the, by the water cooler? We've got to, we've got to come back as a society.
uh, and create that community again, even in, in small ways. And that's where I would say to people, don't underestimate micro interactions. They are giving you a boost of serotonin. That's my second P of the three P's, mm -hmm. positive interactions. You've got to be able to do that. We've got to be able to connect with each other. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this is why people's social skills are going down. And actually social anxiety is going up because we're not exposing ourselves to social situations. Which is just unbelievable, isn't it? You know, as a species, it's taken us two or three million years since we stood up on two legs to get to this point. Yeah. And pretty much all but a couple of hundred years of that time, we've only managed to survive and thrive as a species by working collaboratively, um, by working in tribes, small groups. Sure. That's what's got us to yeah. this point, wasn't it? And yeah. and it wasn't until almost industrial revolution times that this started to change, didn't it? So two, it's been a 200 year blip in human history. Yeah. And and you think, wow, look at the damage it's causing to, to our species yeah. by doing that, you know? So yeah. we have never been as wealthy financially as a species than what granted global North and South massive difference. But in the Western world, yes. we've never been so wealthy, yet we're so we're so devoid on many other levels, aren't we? Which yeah. is presumably why we're having this conversation today. Yeah. And there's all of this stress and anxiety out there, which, which I guess through most of human history has never never existed to this magnitude. There, there have been uh, re there has been research done in that in that um, in the West in general. I'm using that in a very general term. The West mm. is the richest it's ever been, but it's the unhappiest mm. it's ever been. Mm -hmm. you know what does that tell us yeah you know we're, we're losing I, I, something I, I read a very similar article where and obviously this is subjective because people have to say how happy or unhappy yeah they yeah feel. How, I mean, how do you um, measure happiness exactly yeah, yeah. but the, the stats i was seeing it was it was like it was something like post second world war americans and british people were marginally happier than they were in, I think it was 2015, the study that I was yeah. reading. Yeah. It had just been declining since like the 1950s, basically. Yeah. Um, so it was almost a direct, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because a direct cor correlation almost, and this isn't scientifically proven before any scientist jump, jump down for this one, but it's almost like as wealth has gone up, happiness has declined off the yeah. back of it. And maybe it comes back to those five things we were saying, you know, food, water, shelter, clothing, um uh, uh tribe yeah. because we've been able to buy those we've lost the essence of what gives them their their true value yeah yeah we, we've lost that spirit of what mm. is it that, so all those five things can make us happy after that it's just anything is a bonus mm. get we've got to get the basics right and i think we're starting to even lose the basics now yeah and this is where yeah. the next generation of people coming into the workplace are starting to create change. Yeah. There was a, a study done here in Scotland actually saying that, I think it was something like even, it was over 50%, over 50% of people would change their job, not because of more money or salary, but if there was a better work-life balance. Mm. So people are demanding different things from, you know, the, we're kind of the in-between generation, you and I, Mark, but, you know, as an older generation, everything was measured on numbers. So yeah. numbers, profits, numbers, pound signs, dollar signs. Now people who are coming through say, I, I don't want that to be a measure of me and what my results are. My measure is how happy I am to be at work mm. because when you're feeling good, you're going to give your best work. And this is what employers need to understand. This isn't just a little soft skill we need to start addressing. If you want the best work from your people, you have got to make sure they're the feeling the happiest. And not, yeah. not just at work, but, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time at work. So um, I read somewhere 80% of business problems are personal problems. If you've got mm, someone who's right. really struggling with a work-life balance, something's going on at home, they're not going to do their best work, are they? But if you no. can help them in some way as an employer, and that, remember I said right at the beginning, you, individuals have to take it upon themselves, mm. you know, so take some responsibility. But if as an employer, you can allow your staff member one hour off a week to see a therapist, to see a life coach, to do something for their own mental well-being, and you start to see a difference... If you can get someone in to do a talk, if you can provide books or a nice, I've worked in business places, they've got libraries of self-help books. If you can provide that, you're doing something to try and say, we, we, we can do what we can from our side. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help you? You yeah. know, is it flexible working that you need? What else will help? 
there's a mm. there's a limitation i'm with employers on that one you can't bend over backwards you still need to have the work done but if you if you want the best people to work for you they're people yeah we're a, we're a whole being if i know my ducks are in a row at home i'm going to come to work totally focused mm. i'm not worrying about what's going on at home because i'm like yeah i'm i'm feeling really good and I'm, you know i feel very healthy physically as well and mentally so i i know i can take time here to concentrate on my work but we've mm. now got to start looking we've got to look at people as whole people because yeah. look after them and they will do their best work for you yeah it's interesting we talk a lot nowadays in the modern world about purpose and cause and as you were talking now i was reflecting on i was listening to another podcast i listened to millions of podcasts as you probably gathered by now and uh, and they were talking about an example and and, and this is a well cited example like they referenced it as well that during the the blitz in london during the second world war um all of the as they would have been called at the time asylums mental hospitals you know whatever the term which would not be the modern term mm. um they all emptied because all of the people who previously had um severe mental issues whatever they may have been they knew what was going on outside and the places cleared because they said no we want to stand shoulder to shoulder with yeah. you know the other people in london yeah. and, and it was almost like it took that level of extreme purpose and tribe and a lot of the issues that these people have had, wh whether they went away or not, they started to function as a yeah. as a regular member of society. And you know, coming back to what you were saying about you know twenty four seven bombarded with bad news, bad news, you know, climate change, environmental disaster. I mean, this isn't about denial, but we can only take so much. You know, buckets must be filling up all over yeah. the place just by watching the news or f looking yeah. at the app, the, the the news feed on your phone, whatever that may be, yeah. and. Yeah. It's almost so, so. Then I start thinking. Well, it's almost there's purpose and cause, but then there's almost hope versus hopeless. And if if people are feeling hopeless, well, what's the point? You know, the the earth's going to hell in a handcart. We can't do anything about it, and they feel completely out of control. That that can't be healthy for I would think for one's mental health. No, it's not that. That's what's causing you a huge problem. If if you want to change the world, you start with your world. And your world is your home and your family or your partner or yourself. Your world is in your mind. If you want it, you can change the world. You've got to start there. I've written about it in my book, book on the same theme as your uh, what the story you just told about the Blitz. And during the Vietnam War, the US were really concerned they were going to get lots of veterans back who were heroin addicts. Because mm -hmm. while they were out in Vietnam, because of the horrors they were seeing, a lot of them were really addicted to drugs. And they thought, we're going to get zombies coming back. At the end of the war, that didn't happen. Because the veterans that came back often came back to loving families, got back into work, started volunteering, going to church, getting back into their friends, playing their sports again. They had purpose again in Vietnam. They just didn't understand what the point was. And it was escapism. And that's often how addictions begin. You're looking for the chemical dopamine response from somewhere else, whether that's alcohol, nicotine, gambling, drugs. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's other things people are looking for the chemical response. But the veterans that came back from Vietnam War, if they came back to loving families, with a job had community around them went back to their sports they forgot all about the drugs so yeah purpose yeah. is huge we've got to have purpose we've got to have something that we know that we can do and something that you know that, that that's the key to happiness isn't it something to do and someone to mm. love and something to hope for mm. as well. So, and that can change throughout mm. your life as well. So, you know, we're all changing as we get older. We, we have different purposes. Uh, you can have big purposes and little purposes, capital P's and small P's, I'll call them. You know, you can have a big purpose or a little purpose, but it's something that just drives you forward. But if, yes, if we get consumed by everything that's going on, on if you turned on the news right now, it does seem all hopeless, but bad, mm bad news is what sells you know what there's a lot of yeah. good news out there as well there's a lot of people yeah. doing good things and I, they're just not getting the credit and perhaps we should perhaps jim we should start we should start a news channel which only yeah. allows good news positive to be news published. yeah yeah there <laughs> yeah, is there's some magazines it, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Great, there's magazines but, called positive news 
So yeah, right. you, you've, you've got to. And it would, it would make a huge difference. We've got to get the balance right. Yeah. As you were talking there, it reminded me this morning, um, I just did one little thing which made, which set, it set me up for the day. Um, we, we have we have loose leaf tea, um, which is obviously very quintessentially English. Um, but because we don't want tea, but we don't like tea bags, like yeah. it's extra packaging yeah. for no reason. So yeah. so we have loose leaf tea, um, and and we we have Twining's uh, Assam tea, Ooh, loose leaf, which nice. is fine. It's really nice. I love a nice malty Assam, you know me. Um, <laughs> but it, inside the cardboard recycled outer, it's in a it's in a plastic it's in a it's in a plastic bag. So it's in a single use bit of plastic which gets chucked away and I said to Glenda do you know it's been bugging me for a few weeks now I think they should start using foil there's no reason that you know Clipper uses foil yeah. so why yeah. why can't Twinings use foil so anyway over my cup of tea I I went onto their website I found the contact us and I've sent them an email saying I love your product it would be it would taste even better if it came out of a foil rather than a single use plastic so brilliant you you, you change the world one one step one at a step time, at don't time. You? yeah I, it may it I don't know if it's going to make any difference, but it made a massive difference oh, wow. to me because Would, I felt yeah. great going into the day yeah. today. I thought I've yeah. tried to make a positive difference. You've tried. <laughs> That's it. You've tried. Yeah. You've not given up. You've still no. got something in you that wants to try, that wants to make a difference uh, as well. Well done. Good for you. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything we haven't talked about? There, so that's that's bad. There's, there's billions of things there's we haven't talked about. Loads of things we haven't about. talked about. <laughs> If, if what would one area be that we haven't touched on, which you think that's massive, I, I oh. really want to get this out to people. I think it is that whole stop focusing on your problems. Honestly, the mind doesn't mm. work that way. You don't, and also not to be scared of therapy. I mean, I considered calling myself a mindset coach or something else. Like, does that make it a bit more palatable? But if you need the help, get the help. It's all out there. And there's different types of therapy. So you might be someone that needs to talk about your problems. You know what? That's fine. You know, find a therapist that works for you. Mm. But if you are shying away from therapy because you don't want to talk about problems, guess what? There's a therapist for you as well. Yeah. So it's about getting the help that you want without knowing that, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be hard work. There's lots of people yeah. out there with good mental fitness and you can do it too. Your brain is no different to the next person's. And saying yeah. that, you know, I can have a bad day, but the key is to have more good days than bad days. And my bad day doesn't turn into a bad week. Yeah. It's just a bad day. We're allowed to have yeah. that. So it's yeah. about understanding, you know, if you need the help, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's like we've talked about social media, society, everything around us is really gearing us up to be mentally ill. So mm -hmm. it's not your fault there's not something that's wrong with you. It's just that you need a bit of extra support to help yourself. Mm. And once you start understanding that, inform yourself, doing those things, you know, you don't buy the, the gym membership and expect to get fit. You've actually got to take part. Once you start doing those things, you really will start to notice a difference as well. Yeah. And you can notice a difference quite quickly. The brain's amazing at adapting. I, I love that thing there, what you said, which is just because one thing has gone wrong, you don't have to allow it to spiral. And and it made me think, I, I think it was, um, I think the person was given the example of golf and they said, what's the difference between a uh, an amateur golfer and a professional golfer? They said a professional golfer is always thinking about their next shot. An amateur golfer was always thinking about their last shot. That's right. And and I thought that just really encapsulate, That's it. Spot encapsulated on. that point, didn't it? You know, um, which is yeah. just because one shot has gone wrong. It doesn't yeah. mean the next one's going to go wrong. If you keep worrying about that shot, which went yeah. wrong, the next one is more likely to go yeah. wrong. Yeah. So it's it's just yeah. kind of like, move on it's just yeah. compartmentalizing some of this yeah. stuff isn't it it's that's that's mental resilience right there mm. don't think that people who have got good mental health have never had a problem mm. it's just that they don't dwell on it they know how to move on and also don't think they'll never have a problem in the future they don't expect that they've just got this mentality to say and and this almost a mantra in their mind to say i will handle it mm. whatever comes along i will handle it yeah so it's not about when people say, oh, well, I'm, I've got a fear of failure. Guess what? Yeah. Everyone's got a fear of failure. Everyone. Yeah. No one likes to fail. The difference between the people who pick themselves up and go on again is to say, I'll handle the next failure. I might fail again, but I don't care. I'm going to try again. Yeah. Rather than giving up uh, at that first hurdle, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and a great book I, I read on that topic. I, um, I think, I think 
the, was it Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway? I was going to recommend know. that one. That's on my oh, list. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, no. no. Go yeah, for we'll, it. Go we'll, for it. It's we'll come, excellent we'll, we'll, book. We'll come back no, to that. So actually, so actually, now could be a good time to move into the final yeah. closing questions, Jin. Which That's we, we, exactly we on you, my list. <laughs> we, we gave you advance warning of a couple yeah. of closing questions. So, so, so the first one is, if you could recommend three books or podcasts around the topic. Uh, yeah. So you know, spoiler alert, we know one of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what would they be? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I feel the fear and do it anyway by <laughs> Susan Jeffers. Have you heard of it? <laughs> it's really uh, good. I think I read it ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That book I only read it recently, and I thought it was I thought it was brilliant. So yeah. I was like, oh, this is very applicable. And then I found out it was published in 1987. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, wow, that so it just shows it still apply. These are the principles that still apply. It's mm. common sense. And that's why, that's why you know, the generation above, they call it common sense, we should know how to do it. But it is these basics. We're always looking for the next hack or the next app or the next bit of technology that's going to help us with our mental health. But look, you know, here's a book from 1987 that I, I read felt very relevant to right now. I thought mm. it was a pretty new book. So yeah. I was really surprised how old it was. So yeah, yeah absolutely. definitely that one. I love it. And in that, um, Susan Jeffers talks about, I will handle it. That if you yeah. have no fear, having no fear means that you're, you're just saying, I will handle what comes along. And you can still mm. be scared. No one has no fear. Everybody's scared of something. Mm. We're scared of what might happen in the future. But if you're resilient enough, you're going to say, I will handle it. So yeah. I, I love that and, bit in that book. Yeah, it was many years ago. I read it now. But I think from, from memory, it, one of the things Susan talked about was look at all of the things you have done in your life, what you've achieved, yeah. you know. And and you, we very often forget that. But coming back to the sort of survival part of the brain, you know, it doesn't matter that we've lived for forty years. It's like that. That's irrelevant, isn't it? You know, yeah. it becomes irrelevant to that part of yeah. the brain. You know, she was also very much talking around. You will constantly be in a state of fear. It's just, you know, yeah. it's it's a byproduct of moving forwards. And yes. and I guess it's a bit like you know, I, I suppose you could use the analogy. Humans are a bit like plants. You know, if you're not growing then you're probably you're on the downhill to dying type thing yeah, yeah. that's what happens in in all biological life isn't it yeah. you know so and if you're growing and flourishing you're constantly going to be on that edge of your comfort zone yes. which is going to yeah. lead you to the fear yeah you've got to accept that you've got to accept that that fear is part of growing yeah. and moving you forward so yeah, yeah um just just love that book um, brilliant another the podcast i really like is just one thing by michael mosley yeah. I don't know if you heard it. What I love about it, it is just about one thing. So there's so much information out there, Mark. We can be overwhelmed. But what <laughs> yeah. he talks about is like, just do one thing this week. Just yeah. drink more water this week. Just go for a walk this week, every day. So I love how it's just, it stops the overwhelm. And it's just saying it's all these basic things, why you should do it, why you should do it. Just focus on one thing. Just yeah. rather than being, oh, well, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And social media tells me I should be doing all of these things and meditating at the same time as well. Mm. You know, that's just, uh, it's not appealing, is it, at all? So no. I love just one thing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well. And it's funny you say that literally just before I emailed Twinings this morning, um, <laughs> Glenda, Glenda put one of them on and we were listening to the one about Pilates. Uh, yes. So we actually had the, we had that one on this morning over breakfast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And it's so good, isn't it, saying that, well, just try that. And if it doesn't work for yeah. you, that's fine. Try something else. But you're yeah, going to find, absolutely. you're going to hit on one thing. And if you do find one thing, keep that up as you add the second thing. Mm. And then the third thing, it's just habit stacking. That's yeah. all it is. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I love that. No, that's a great shout. Yeah, I love that yeah. one as well. And it, they're simple. They're short episodes as well, aren't they, on that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As well. So, yeah, they're not too overwhelming too. Uh, and the other thing I really love is, um, can I... Can I have a TED Talk as one of my things? You can have whatever you want to have, yeah. Yeah. Uh, look up the TED Talk, Sleep is Your Superpower by Matthew Walker. It's amazing. He's also written a book called Why We Sleep. Um, but Sleep is Your Superpower is a great TED Talk. Uh, Why We Sleep is also a great book. But if you've got insomnia and problem sleeping, do not read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's just going to raise your anxiety and stress levels. 
if you if you get quite good sleep, it's absolutely fascinating. But he's the right. current sort of sleep expert that you know my go to at the minute. Um, and it's just about that value of sleep, which I and in my work I place a lot of value upon as well. If you can get good sleep, yeah. it's not anything else you have to fit into your day. You should be just prioritizing your sleep. My sleep is non negotiable. So I prioritize my sleep and my sleep routine and that's what keeps me going. So it also adding on to that just one thing theory, mm. it's something mm. you should be able to fit into your life quite easily. We're sleeping anyway. Yeah. It's a biological response to sleep. Um, I, and when people say, oh, I can't sleep, Jin, I'll always say, I can make, I can make you sleep. I'll keep you awake for, awake for 36 hours. Yeah. If I keep you awake for 36 hours, you will sleep. It's a biological response. Yeah. You just can't help yeah. it. And that's that's a fascinating thing about sleep. We've got to. We've got to sleep. I, I haven't read the book, but I know Glenda has that book. I've seen it on yeah. uh, the book pile downstairs, actually. Okay, um, but good. I'm going to read it now. I'm going to read yeah. it. That's the one. I haven't read that, so I'm definitely going to yeah. have a read it because I know it's in the house. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. But as you say, it's for something which um, is so natural, how come it can be so difficult? <laughs> we've made it complicated haven't we, <laughs> absolutely yeah we've got all yeah. these sleep apps and again going back to you know in the world east and west is that something we've forgotten you know yeah. we've got electricity that keeps us awake longer we've got social media we've got video games we've you know it's it's seen as laziness to sleep whereas you know even in spain they have a siesta yeah so I, yeah I, i'm you know. one of these people where literally as soon as my head hits the pillow i'm just gone and Good like very you. often oh. glenda will be talking to me and next morning she'll say <laughs> you kind of we were mid conversation and all of a sudden i looked sleep. over and you were just gone it's like well that's why i go to bed yeah <laughs> now You're i'm old turn obviously up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what i was saying it com comes with age as well but yeah no yeah. sleep is sleep is free therapy and it is your superpower so, yeah, yeah that's great so yeah Thank they're, you for those. they're my three they're my three so final final question if you could transport yourself back in time uh, and talk to an 18 year old gin or any age that you think is most applicable to you what three bits of advice would you try and impart on yourself i'm going to be a bit controversial here and i have got three bits of advice but the first thought that came to my mind when i read that question that you guys sent me i thought you know what now i'm old and wise nothing <laughs> Yeah. I wouldn't give myself any advice because you've got to go through it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what, what I know now is only because I went through it. Yeah. If, if I gave my advice to not go through it or to avoid it or to, you know, make things better or easier, I wouldn't be the person I am now. I wouldn't have yeah. this amount of strength and resilience. So sometimes we have to go through it mm. to like we talked about growing we've got that's the way we grow it's painful and yeah. it's scary and if i gave myself advice to either avoid it or treat it differently or something's come along you'll be all right and all this you know then would i really be experiencing it looking back it's been mm. hard mm. but there's you know i thought god that's the first thought that goes through my mind now a, a few even a few years ago if you'd asked me i might have come up with three bits of advice yeah but i think I now think that's a I think that's a fantastic answer because I, I, suddenly as you're talking, I had Back to the Future. I had like Michael J. Fox in my head thinking, yes. you, know, you, you could have affected like the ripples through the timeline. That's right. Would have, who knows what may have happened, good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. But you could, you could be changing the future. <laughs> yeah. For, you know not what I mean? necessarily if, for if the you, better. Not for the better. You know? Yeah. So, so so a common one is, you know, don't don't worry, don't worry as much because it's all going to be okay. That that's quite a common one we get in our three, but yeah. it, even that could have a ripple through the timeline, couldn't it? Yeah. But even if I said that to you now <laughs> for the future, Mark, like don't worry, everything's yeah. going to be okay. I don't yeah. know if you'd believe me. No. Because at you the know, time just, in the moment, yeah. it feels in the moment, like, it's a like catastrophe, it's, it's doesn't everything. it? Everything. It is yeah. everything. And there have been some things that have been everything. You know, bereavements, yeah. real loss. Yeah. You know, that's everything to you. You can't yeah. say to someone going through a lot, don't worry, everything will be okay. You know, yeah. that's, that's, you've got to go through. I actually say grief is a positive response because if you didn't grieve, it means it didn't mean anything. Yeah. So for, yeah. for anyone grieving right now, I know it's horrible, but it just shows how much love was there. That's what we're looking at. Uh, as well so so yeah I did I did sort of write down then three pieces of advice but if if you're happy with that that I mean that was my initial answer nothing I wouldn't say anything and say yeah, you know no, you I, just have I to go through it yeah I love it I think yeah I think that's it's, 
it's the probably the the most uh, without offending other guests that's probably the most sophisticated answer we've had because yeah oh, who, i'll take yeah, the word I, sophisticated you, yeah. any day <laughs> I, I i probably i'm i'm probably with you 100 percent. i i have I don't live with regrets. You know, there's things that maybe I would have changed, but I don't regret stuff because what's the point in regretting it? Otherwise you're into, you're not thinking about your next shot. You're thinking about yeah. your last shot analogy yeah. again, aren't you? So yeah, yeah. I think. But you must learn from to, it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's something to learn from. But if you, and this is where people, um, sort of parents um, are now, especially our generation parents with children going to university, they're very much helicopter parents. I talk to a lot of university tutors and they'll say the helicopter parents now, which, being a helicopter they're just monitoring them all the time they're mm -hmm. even choosing their course for them they're doing everything for them we're not preparing people for the real world we're not we're not bringing up adults we're mm -hmm. bringing up people that are really going to be over reliant on something else to help them and we're not yeah. getting self-sufficient so yeah. that's why and i said yeah nothing you've got to be self-sufficient yeah and how you know how selfish is that you know wow you know do, doing that yeah. if someone did it to you you'd be thinking this person's being really selfish yeah, yeah. That's now. But if you're an 18 yeah. year old first going to uni, it'd be lovely to be that looked after Yeah, as well. Yeah, it's that's comforting. Very true. There's a comfort yeah. in it. And I can see why a parent would do it because you don't want anything to go wrong. You want yeah. your child to have the lovely experience. But are we really preparing them? So actually, young adults are getting worse at decision making. Mm -hmm. And that comes to making decisions even in the workplace. Yeah. as well and because we've yeah. got lovely google we just go to google for everything so actually critical thinking skills have reduced over the last few th few years and um that uh, conscious decision making gathering information gathering evidence to make a decision all these skills are going down because we are giving our 18 year old selves advice if yeah. you see what I mean, you know, so if, yeah, if yeah. I had a child who Absolutely. was 18, that that's what I would be doing. Oh, don't do this, do that. This is how I did it. And you should do it this way. But that person's got to learn on their own in their own way. Yeah. Intra that Where we're going, we don't need roads. Oh, I love that. <laughs> see, it all comes back to movies. That's a back, back to, to the, the future movies, quote yeah. for everyone there. Where we're going, we don't need roads. I love that. Uh, <laughs> well, th th this has been a fascinating conversation for me i hope for the listeners as well oh, i've just got so much i've out loved of chatting well, you to know. you mark that's been good that, could have talked for ages i feel like we've just literally scraped kind of surface. tip of the iceberg here yeah so so m maybe maybe you know if, if if our diaries ever um align there could be a sure. part two to this you know because i think there's i think there's much two. more here yeah yeah that, that was amazing jen thank you so much if people want to reach out to you how's the best place for them to find you uh, I've got my own podcast, Stress Bucket Solutions, which I mentioned, and my book, How to Empty Your Stress Bucket. But everything can be found on my website, which is ginlally.com. So G-I-N, gin like the drink, L-A-L-L-I.com. -L Brilliant. Thank you. Pleasure. So as we've said, the links are all in the show notes. If you've enjoyed today's show, then please rate and review us. It really helps other people find this podcast so we can spread the word even further. And finally, a massive thank you to our sponsors, Larkin Gowan. Without Larkin Gowan, this show would not be possible. So please follow the link to see how their team of experts can help you and your business. That just leaves us to say, everyone have a great week. Take care of yourself and boost your health, wealth and self. <laughs>